Blue Stem Natives presents Feed the Bees, Supporting Pollinators with Native Plants. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. I'll start with a bit about us and how we got started. Blue Stem Natives is a women-owned native plant nursery located in Norwell, Mass. We strive to grow local ecotype plants from seed whenever possible and we're committed to using environmentally and ecologically friendly farming practices. Our passion is making native plants more accessible to the everyday gardener and increasing awareness and education around the benefits of using native plants in the landscape. I'm often asked what got me interested in native plants. Well, a few years ago, I had one of those crazy light bulb moments. I had been a dental assistant for about 18 years and decided to go back to school to finish my degree in biology. I heard Dr. Doug Tallamy's Bringing Nature Home and that light bulb just went off. It was exactly what I had been looking for to make a real difference in the environment. I then joined Wild Ones South Shore Chapter, discovered this deep interest and realized that this was it for me. I joined up with my partners Jasmine and Britt and we got to work building the nursery from the literal ground up. I am definitely not an expert, but I am passionate about continuously learning and teaching others what I know. So let's get started. Our goals today are to gain an understanding of why using native plants in our landscape is so important, some tech steps we can take to best support pollinators, and what plants you can add to your garden to build habitat for and attract a multitude of pollinators. So what are native plants? Over thousands of years, wild plants have grown naturally, adapting to each region's unique environmental conditions. The USDA defines native plants as those which existed here without human introduction, they're part of the balance of nature that has developed over hundreds or thousands of years in a particular region or ecosystem. These plants are disappearing at an alarming rate, mostly due to human activities, such as urban development, agribusiness, and the introduction of invasive species. The loss of native plant communities has reduced wildlife habitat and the genetic diversity necessary for balanced ecosystems. Alongside these plants are thousands of native insect species who have developed adaptations and co-reliances on each other for survival. As you're well aware, nectar and pollen can be found in many plants, so what makes native plants so special? Going back to that definition of native plants, these species are so well adapted to our growing conditions that they typically do not need all of the extra care that goes into landscape plantings, because they're already well suited for the space. They provide a tangible way to improve our environment while supporting wildlife all in our own backyards. One of the things that defines native plants is where they grow. Pay attention to the phrase region or ecosystem. We have grown accustomed to following growing zones, but when it comes to natives, it's more important to understand what ecoregion you reside in. For example, in New England, we have some of the following ecoregions, Northeastern Highlands, Northeastern Coastal, Acadian Plains and Hills, Atlantic Coast Pine Barrens, and Eastern Great Lakes Lowlands. If you really wanna dig in, you can go all the way down to ecoregions of Massachusetts, which takes into account microclimates of different areas. What is native to Natick isn't necessarily native to Nantucket. Why do we focus on ecoregions instead of the more familiar grow zones? Growing zones refer to temp temperature changes in an area, what can grow here rather than what should grow here. Zone six can encompass areas like parts of Massachusetts all the way across the Great Plains and up into Washington, However, the plants that are native in Washington are not native in Massachusetts. They both support different species of wildlife completely, and planting outside of the ecoregion can have very serious repercussions on vulnerable wildlife populations. What's the difference between using native plants versus non-native plants? Simply put, 
non-native plants support non-native insects. The tree of heaven was introduced in the 1700s as a horticulture specimen plant. It has no natural predators here, so it became invasive. It is one of the preferred host plants for the spotted lanternfly, one of the latest bad news bugs on the scene. Just one example of how the choices we make can have long lasting effects on the environment around us. The spotted lanternfly has been moving into our area, so if you do see one, take a quick photo and then dispose of this insect. Send your photo and location to MassNRC. The website is located at the bottom of this slide. The same way that the tree of heaven is a host plant for the spotted lanternfly, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of native plants which serves as hosts for native insects. Host plants are those which support most or all of the different life stages of an organism, more than just providing nectar or pollen for adults. One of the best species to highlight this is the beloved monarch butterfly. It's well known that the monarch butterfly requires the Asclepius species in order to complete its life cycle. Adult monarchs lay their eggs on the milkweed plant. The larvae hatch and the caterpillars, which have evolved protections against the milky latex sap, feed on the milkweed leaves. The flowers then provide nutritious nectar for adult monarchs. As milkweed populations dropped throughout the last century, we saw a precipitous drop in the monarch population. With education and outreach, people started planting more milkweed and we saw an exciting rise in the monarch population this past winter. It's important to understand how our plant choices have a ripple effect on species. Please don't plant tropical milkweed as it has been shown to disrupt monarch migration habits. You can plant other native species such as Asclepius tuberosa butterfly weed. It's a gorgeous plant that behaves very well in the garden setting. We also have Asclepius incarnata, which is rose milkweed, and Asclepius exaltata, which is poke milkweed. It's an excellent choice for shadier spaces. Common milkweed is wonderful if you have wide open spaces and can allow it to spread freely. Another example of when good plants go wrong. We're looking at our native lupine on the right, Lupinus perennis. Once found throughout Maine and the East Coast, this plant has been virtually taken over by the Western species Lupinus polyphyllus. The two plants hybridize very easily and it renders the plant useless to the butterfly who requires it as a host plant, the Carner blue butterfly. This beautiful creature has become functionally extinct in the region as its host plant has been lost. The vast fields of lupine that you see flowering in Maine now are mostly hybrids of the two plants or well dominated by Lupinus polyphyllus. Just as Lepidoptera species can be specialists, so can many of our native bee species. It's estimated that 20 to 45% of our native bee species are pollen specialists, requiring the pollen from a handful of plants, some even subsisting on a single species. Pollen isn't the only factor which determines speciality though. The Macropus bee species, known as oil bees, are attracted to the perfumed oils produced by a particular plant, namely Lysimachia ciliata, or fringed loosestrife. These bees, and we have three different species in Massachusetts, have specialized scrapers on their legs designed to collect the oils from the plant's flowers. The bees use this oil to line their nests for waterproofing and also mix it in with the pollen on which they lay their eggs. As populations of Lysimachia ciliata dwindle, so do the populations of these bees. To our point of the detriment of non-native plants, these bees do not utilize the oils of the invasive purple loosestrife. As an aside, this is also a perfect example of why we shouldn't rely on common names, as these two plants actually aren't related, even though they have a similar common name.
When we think about pollinators, our first thoughts are often bees. However, there's so many different types of pollinators that we should be concerned about. Pollination itself is defined as the transfer of pollen grains from the male anther of a plant to the female stigma. And this can happen in a wide variety of ways. Wind pollination blows lightweight pollen grains from plant to plant, and it's mostly the cause of our pollen allergies. Some plants use water to pollinate their plants, especially mosses and other very low growing plants. Mechanical pollination happens when another organism interacts with the plant and collects the pollen on their body and transfer that pollen to other plants as they move about. These include all kinds of flying insects, birds, ants, rodents, and even some mammals. When we're thinking about the most well-known pollinators, honeybees and bumblebees come to mind. These insects do exhibit very different pollination habits though. People who are not familiar with different bee species are often surprised to learn that honeybees are not the most efficient pollinators. What pollination they accomplish is largely due to the high population. In contrast, bumblebees in particular are 25 to 40% more efficient in their pollination efforts. Part of this is accomplished due to their sheer size and the manner by which they collect pollen. Honeybees collect pollen on their legs while bumblebees collect it all over their bodies, trapping it with their fuzz. Bumblebees are also able to retrieve pollen from a wide variety of flowers, including ones that have closed petals, such as turtle heads. They have the mass to be able to bowl their way into the flower, whereas the smaller honeybees don't have the power to get into these tight spaces. In addition, bumblebees utilize their powerful wings to buzz pollinate. They beat their wings and make that pleasant buzzy noise, which distributes pollen to surrounding flowers, even if the bee itself doesn't visit each flower. As a fun fact, apparently that buzz happens to be middle C, which is the same note as Hey Jude. They're Beatles fans. Humans have a complicated relationship with insects, but once you have a greater understanding about their important role in our world, it's easy to agree that we need to do some work to improve the habitat in which they live. There are a few steps you can take that will provide the best bang for your buck. As you consider your space, keep these points in mind. We want you to span the seasons, provide fresh water sources, avoid pesticides, no need to clean, and plant straight species. For some cool design ideas, check out the Boston-based design from Wild Ones. Choose plants that provide pollen and nectar across the seasons. As you plan out your space, make sure you're taking into consideration bloom times. We all love seeing a garden full of colorful flowers, but we don't want to have just one big show for a couple of weeks in June and then just a bunch of shades of green for the rest of the year. By planting according to bloom time, we can ensure there is vital habitat and food sources for insects and other wildlife from the very early spring all the way into late fall. All forms of wildlife needs fresh water to survive. Bees and insects are no different. Provide a safe and clean, fresh water source in your yard, making sure there are shallow areas for little creatures to rest and hydrate. If you're not able to consistently replenish water sources or keep them clean, consider installing a small pond or water feature that cycles the water. Recent legislation on banning neonicotinoids is a step in the right direction, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. Discussing use of pesticides is tough because there's lots of conflicting information. What you need to understand when you see the words pollinator friendly in regards to pesticide sprays is that legally, toxicity of a pesticide is measured by the levels at which 50% of the bees will die. Everything under that level can technically be considered pollinator friendly. 
It's important to understand that research and testing is done on adult honeybees, not immature honeybees or any other bee species. So products are using a broad term of pollinators, but they're only reflecting a very small portion of the population. There are companies that state their products are sprayed at safe times of the day. They're talking about avoiding times where adult bees are flying. They aren't talking about the pesticides that is reaching the ground nests, affecting immature bees as well as nesting queens. Neem oil is touted as a safe, organic, broad-spectrum pesticide for plants. It falls under the same issues, and if it's used inappropriately, the oil can have detrimental effects on the respiratory systems of adults and can affect the growth of immature larvae. Remember that just because something is labeled organic doesn't automatically mean it is harmless. Permethrin is used to prevent tick bites on humans, mostly through treated clothing. Homemade devices known as tick tubes have become popular. You soak cotton balls with permethrin, stuff them into toilet paper tubes, and then place those around your yard for rodents to take back to their nests. The permethrin soaked cotton balls kills the ticks on the rodents without harming them. However, permethrin is highly toxic to all bee species. Many of our native bee species are ground dwelling and love to use old rodent holes for their nests. These bees are being killed off by the residual permethrin. The lesson here is that all of our actions have a ripple effect and it's important to research and understand what may result from our actions. Along with ground dwelling, many native bees use standing plant matter to lay eggs and overwinter. There are many bee species that will pack a nectar bag, lay an egg, and then plug the entrance. The larvae hatches and eats the nectar and then chews its way out of the stem. Leaving these stems behind in the fall provides this habitat as well as supports a ton of adult wildlife. In the spring, lots of people love to say to wait until the temperatures are consistently above 50 degrees before cleaning up. In actuality, there isn't an exact temperature that triggers all of the bees to come out. Especially when talking about specialist bees, they need very particular plants to forage on. So if those plants haven't bloomed yet, chances are good the other bees will remain in the ground for a while longer. It takes a mind shift to stop seeing these decaying plants as a mess and rather as an important aspect of a thriving ecosystem. We like to encourage the use of straight species or wild type plants as much as possible. Many, if not most of the plants available from conventional garden centers are cultivars. Cultivars are cultivated varieties, plants which have been cloned in order to preserve a certain attribute. By cloning these plants, we are greatly reducing genetic diversity, which can lead to a decreased ability to fight off diseases and infections, along with a host of other issues. Cultivars often cannot support wildlife to the same extent as straight species. Insects and birds rely on color a lot in order to identify plants that they can feed on. When we manipulate the colors of flowers or leaves, we're reducing or eliminating the ability of these organisms to find their food sources. You may notice that many of our native plants have the same color blooms, lots of yellow, white, and pink. Unsurprisingly, these colors are the ones best seen by our native bees. Varieties which change the physical structure of the flowers prevents insects from being able to reach the pollen or nectar, even if there is any. The double or triple blooms are beautiful for us to look at, but they are not pollinator friendly. Cultivars are often sterile varieties and do not spread the same way as native plants do. One of the greatest aspects of having a native plant garden is that you're able to freely collect and share seeds and plants from your own garden with neighbors and friends. We've been conditioned to see native plants as weedy or only belonging to large meadows. Native plants can fill a meadow, but they can also be used in more formal settings. They can be as organized and well manicured as you like, 
and they also don't have to be all native. Aim to have more native than non-native. Perfection isn't the goal. Now that we have the basics covered, let's talk about the plants. I'll go over a few options for each plant type, but you don't have to settle for just these ones. Use this list as a jumping off point to fill your landscape with a wide variety of species. If you've ever heard Dr. Talamy speak, you know he is an oak stan. It's not hard to understand why when you learn that oak trees are the host plant for well over 400 different species of Lepidoptera, which are butterflies and moths, like this cute little oak skipper, and also supports all manner of native bees, wasps, and other flying insects. You may be wondering, how do oak trees support bees? Oak trees provide valuable habitat support with many species residing within its bark layers or inside cavities that naturally form. And there are wasp species that use the leaves to form galls in which their larvae mature. A plant doesn't need to have flowers in order to have pollinator value. Willow trees are iconic in their structure and most people feel as though they don't have the space to house a giant tree or they've been taught that willows are bad to have around structures as the root systems seek out water. The good news is there are quite a few willow species that work very well in a smaller landscape, including Salix petiolaris or meadow willow. It has a smaller shrub form and can handle drier conditions than other species. Willows are hugely valuable when it comes to supporting pollinators, especially our early emerging native bumblebees. The Bombus terracola is an endangered species here in Massachusetts and rely on the early flowers of Salix species for survival. Our native cherry trees are excellent choices for our spaces, both for the wildlife as well as for us. These gorgeous trees provide shade, fragrant flowers, and edible fruit and there's likely a prunus species to fit just about any condition you might have in your yard. These trees are an excellent choice to replace the invasive Bradford pear. You'll see a wide variety of pollinators visiting your prunus trees, including the very cool hummingbird clearwing moth, which is a large moth species capable of hovering much like a hummingbird does. For your shadier areas, you can't go wrong with planting a few spice bush, Lindera benzoin. Known as Forsythia of the woods, these tall shrubs have a lot going for them. The beautiful yellow blossoms herald early spring and they smell so, so good. The berries and leaves are also edible. This is one of my favorite shrubs as it is the host plant for arguably the cutest caterpillar you will ever see the spice bush swallowtail. Next on our list is one of the most popular shrubs. We get a lot of requests for this one and we recommend it often. Amelenchia canadensis is known as service berry or shad blow and has a lot going for it. The fragrant white blossoms will be visited by all manner of insects and the berries are enjoyed by both humans and wildlife. Here you can see a rather nondescript moth, Abagratus benjamini, which is also an at-risk species here in Massachusetts. New Jersey tea has recently seen a popularity boom as people have recognized its ability to withstand our fussy climate and crummy soils. This is a shorter form shrub, perfect for foundation planting. The delicate white blooms have a great scent and will be visited by a pollinators in the late summer. One of the prettiest visitors may be the spring azure butterfly, which has gorgeous iridescent wings that catch the light. New Jersey tea is a host plant for numerous insects and attracts hummingbirds and bees as well. Don't let the sumac moniker scare you off. The fragrant sumac is an excellent choice for landscapes. 
This shrub grows between 6 to 12 feet tall and spreads to form a thicket shape, perfect for windbreaks and privacy hedges. The glossy green foliage turns vibrant shades of red and burgundy in the fall, which makes it a great replacement for the invasive burning bush. Sumac is a host plant for many insects, including the red-banded hair streak butterfly, and is primarily pollinated by bees. Let's move on to perennials. It's easy to see how Monarda fistulosa came about its common name of bee balm. Also known as wild bergamot, it smells amazing and has fantastic color. Monarda attracts a number of specialist bees, bumblebees, predatory wasps, hummingbirds, and hawk moths. Here you see a tiny black sweat bee, which has only ever been recorded on Monarda. Bee balm also attracts beneficial wasps, such as sand wasps, which are known to help control the invasive brown marmorated stink bug. Penstemon digitalis is one of the po pollinator powerhouse plants that we recommend. These plants always have something fun visiting, and the happy buzzing noises that you hear as you walk by will bring a smile to your face. Penstemon digitalis has a tendency to spread, so plant this in an area it can fill in, or choose a less aggressive species like Penstemon hirsutus. Bumblebees love the deep tube flowers, as do hummingbirds. Prunella vulgaris is one of the latest must-haves. It's low-growing and spreads to form a ground cover ideal for pollinators. This plant can take moderate foot traffic and can be mowed if you really choose to. It has an incredibly long bloom cycle. Along with supporting many of our native bumblebees, it also supports other species such as this adorable leafcutter bee. Joe Pieweed is a top choice for us at Bluestem. It has stunning color and adds structure to gardens. While many of the native Joe Pie species are quite tall, they do respond well to spring cutbacks, or you can plant a shorter species like Eutrochium dubium. Butterflies, moths, wasps, bees, and hummingbirds all love Joe Pie as much as we do. I know I say this a lot, but this is definitely one of my favorites. Chelone glabra is known as turtle head for the unique shape of its flowers. Bumblebees are the bee of choice for these flowers as they're able to muscle their way into the tight mouth. I absolutely love walking by the patch of turtle heads and listening to the ha happy buzzing of the bumbles as they make their way from flower to flower. The pink Chelone lyoniae is a popular species and it's often requested. It isn't one that we carry as it's native to the mid-Atlantic coast and it's introduced in New England. We could probably make an entire presentation around all of the species of asters that are native here, but suffice to say there's a native for every spot in your yard. Asters come in all different sizes and colors and provide a valuable food source late into the fall season, especially for our cooler temperature tolerant native bees. If you're serious about supporting pollinators, you will have this plant in your garden. Goldenrods are a powerhouse plant for pollinators and support so many different species, I couldn't even decide on which one to highlight. It's important to understand the way goldenrods will behave in a garden setting. Some are very aggressive and will take over a small space. Look to Bluestem and Showy Goldenrod for two options that behave nicely in smaller gardens. We do have a few annual plants, which are native here. One of our favorites being partridge pea, Camacrista fasciculata. This legume is a fast growing annual, perfect for filling in areas where you have removed other plants and want a placeholder. Bees are attracted to the sweet yellow flowers and rest under the delicate shade of the leaves. 
If you're walking through the garden and get a sudden craving for pancakes, it might be that you're standing near Sweet Everlasting, which smells like delicious maple syrup. I love showing this one to the kids who come to the nursery. This plant is a host for the gorgeous American Lady Butterfly, which lays its eggs on the leaves. If you're having trouble fending off the deer visiting your flowers, give Rudbeckia herta a try. They tend to avoid these plants. This self-sowing, short-lived perennial only lasts a year or two, but the patch itself will grow over time as the seed bank fills. These cherry flowers attract many bees and butterflies with their bright colors and large ray formation. They do tend to easily hybridize with other Rudbeckia species, so be careful not to mix them in your yard. So many people consider jewelweed to be a nuisance plant. However, it really is a fabulously beneficial one to have along a wooded edge. Hummingbirds delight in the tubular flowers and long-tongued bees received a lot of sustenance from them. Give this one room to spread and you can cut it back if you really need to. Okay, for real, this one's a true favorite of mine. Wild strawberry is our go-to recommendation for the frequent question, what can I use as a lawn replacement? This low growing, fast spreading plant has adorable white flowers and delicious berries, and it's loved by bees and is the larval host plant for several butterfly and moth species, including this gorgeous early hair streak butterfly. Last spring, we brought in a table full of bearberry and we had an adorable little visitor. The same bumblebee staked her claim on the bearberry flowers and visited every day like clockwork. She would shelter under the leaves when it rained and was often spotted sipping water from the tiny puddles formed on the leaves. This plant does not have large showy flowers, but that doesn't stop the bees. We do have some recommended swaps for problematic plants. Vinca might be a lovely ground cover, but that's all it has going for it. It's very aggressive, as ground covers often are, and they often fill in large areas of delicate woodlands. There are so many better native alternatives that support wildlife, such as wild strawberry, wild ginger, and three-toothed cinquefoil, often visited by the epically cool sphinx moth. Burning bush is an invasive shrub brought here by the 1860s from Asia. In Massachusetts, it's banned for sale, trade, and planting. Birds eat the berries and deposit them in nearby woods, where the new seedlings take over forest understories, reducing habitat for our native plant species. Blueberry, on the other hand, is one of the best shrubs to plant for local wildlife. It supports a plethora of native caterpillars, and some of those caterpillars go on to feed baby birds. White flowers that are sometimes tinged pink attract bees and other pollinators. Blueberry bushes also have a lovely fall color that rival burning bush. Wrapping up our plant choices today, thistle is a very common wildflower that can handle a wide variety of terrain. Our native field thistle is one of the best wildflowers we can plant to support native bees and other pollinators. Not to mention, it's quite a bit less pokey than the other thistle species. If you'd like to learn more about these plants and a ton of others, we highly recommend these books. We also love the information from the Xerces Society and Becology, a citizen science research project led by Dr. Robert Chagir of UMass Dartmouth. Our website, bluestemnatives.com, contains descriptions of all the plants that we are growing, as well as detailed lists for recommended plants for just about any garden. Use our filters to choose the best plants based on the sun and soil types. We're opening May 1st, 2022 for in-person and online shopping. Thanks so much for joining us today. Have a great day, everyone.